Welcome back, everyone. We have a great guest with us today. We have Knox from Enforced. How are you doing? Doing great. How are you? I'm doing great, dude. Um, it's a Monday, so it's not that awesome, but you know. No, Mondays worries. are good. I like Mondays. Not if you're Garfield. I don't know. but <laughs> Oh, yeah. Cool. That's true. Well, let's get into this. You guys wrote a 32-minute record. What was the writing and recording process to make it that length? Um, uh, This came kind of naturally. Uh, the songs are just shorter in formula anyway uh, in comparison to Kill Grid or anything like that. So um, we wanted it to be... We wanted it to be shorter than Kill Grid, but also longer. So we wanted like an even 10 songs, five on side A, five on side B. And uh, we had nine done. And then we figured we had this really old song that we never recorded, or I think we only played it maybe once or twice live, like back in like 2017 or 18. And uh, that song, we threw that on there because it fit perfectly. Uh, and it finally had its own, finally had its home. Uh, and that's the song Nation of Fear. So that just kind of rounded it out. Nice. Because I, I, I was reading. So you guys said that this is like the sound you guys wanted to be, wanted to be at. With that song coming from an older time, did you guys like reinvent it a bit? Oh, yeah. We tweaked it, but um, not by much. Uh, the solos, the solos and the lyrics are completely different. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Just the, I mean, it's a pretty standard, straightforward riff, so there really wasn't much to change. Makes sense. I mean, that's with thrash, anyways, because pretty much, yeah. Well, it's it's not a great thrash record if you're not straightforward like that. So true. As a vocalist, how do you go about writing your lyrics? Uh, I write them kind of like a research paper. At least that's what my girlfriend says. Um, I find a topic that I'm interested in. That could be anything, uh, or I find inspiration from something completely random. And then I kind of start researching everything about it and then, or as much as I can handle. And then I try basically to write the lyrics as kind of like a metaphorical research paper around them. Uh, like <clears throat> perfect example. I've been watching a lot of uh, Gordon Ramsay's uh, Hell's Kitchen. Have you ever watched that before? I'm yeah. really far behind. I don't watch television much. So I'm just now starting it. And it is a nightmare uh, how delusional and and insane some people are so uh i'm finding a lot of uh i find the the delusion super interesting so i think i'm gonna probably write a song about that well i'm excited to hear that one yeah that i mean sound pretty crazy man <laughs> yeah I, I, you find it anywhere uh wherever you can get it so if, if i'm getting a lot of help from gordon ramsay i'll take it <laughs> So I'm guessing on the next record, you'll probably have a thank you to Gordon Ramsay for that track. You're gonna be like, "This no, one's for Gordon Ramsay." Right. No, <laughs> unless unless he unless he hits me up, then he'll get. He he wants to collab. He wants to be on the record with you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that'd be great. <laughs> he can get the um, front cover. Oh my god. Um. So with you being a like vocalist, do you have to hear the music before you write the lyrics, or are they just you do your research and then you write them out and then oh this pair is perfect with the song? Is that how do you go about that? I do. I, song comes first, and then I won't even write the lyrics yet, like have them pre-written. Mm -hmm. I just kind of leave it at the research state and just kind of I'm like, all right, that's this whole chunk of God knows what song, um, and how that's even going to play out, and I try to match the lyrics with the vibe so to speak um to to, to kind of make everything match as, as well as pot or line up as much as possible and then so i'll be like okay this topic is going to be this song so now let's start to try and write with the cadence and the beat and everything try and make and it how sound long catchy did, how long would you say that process usually takes for you it can take anywhere between like a week or it can take 15 minutes um like okay. Like the song uh, Ultra Violence came from literally nowhere. I was writing for something else. Nice. And um, I just jotted those lyrics down. Out of, I don't know. from the, They came from the void. And uh, I just wrote all those lines down. And I was like, well, that's Ultra Violence. And I was like, <laughs> on to the next one. Uh, didn't really, didn't think, it, uh, like, I didn't think of it about it at all. Just wrote it down and just moved it. Just was like, okay, that's going to be the super short one. And then kept going and then later i'm reading it i'm like damn that sounds insane <laughs> i have mean, no idea where it came from 
You're just cool. reading your lyrics and your mind's getting blown the whole entire time. Like, wow, I came up with this. <laughs> I know. It's, it shocks me every time I read it. Or like, I was just like, there's no way that I made this up. But then I look at all my like notes and like psychotic little scribblings and stuff. And I'm just like, yeah, you did. It's crazy. Sounds like you could totally make a book into that eventually. Like, let I was look. thinking about it. Yeah, I was thinking about doing that at some point. Uh, trying to compile all the um for every song go into detail about like what it actually means and then cite my sources <laughs> like actually make a research paper out of a lyric book uh, i thought that would be kind of a cool approach to it i don't think anyone's ever done that before i don't think so either i think a lot of fans would appreciate that because like like i said we all want to know where you guys come up with all these insane lyrics and what's mm-hmm. really going on in your brain while you're doing that you know uh yeah i mean i would it would take a long time because like once i'm once it's kind of done and out there, it's just kind of completely erased from my head. So I have to like go back to everything and really f- try to get back in that mindset and to figure to under even even fucking understand what the hell I'm talking about. Dang. Well, that makes sense. So yep. how long did it take you guys to write this record? Uh, I don't know. About a year, year and a half. Dang. Um, and that, is that including the recording process too? Oh, no. The recording process was like a week. Um, <laughs> uh, in a week in September, the first week of September 2022. Um, I think after, cause that would be 2022. So the year before is 2021. Yeah. Like after Kilgore came out, we just started writing this one. Like, and we're already writing another one. Okay. Um, well, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, we, we, traditionally we've never stopped. I mean, writing or working or with riffs and tweaking this and that, uh, and the other to just keep the juices flowing. I mean, I mean, not everything works obviously, but like to keep those, the momentum, uh going is really important not just i keep the bond within the band with writing because like if you don't have that chemistry it doesn't sound that great you know Mm -hmm. so that's yeah we we're always we practice once a week they write the the day after that and our basis chungo usually has like he just bought a house so he's been having a lot of uh, cookouts and crab boils and stuff like that or shrimp boils excuse me and uh so we're always hanging out and doing stuff together like we're we're really close as people makes sense yeah. um the song mercy kill killing fields draws inspiration from a personal experience you went through with your cousin passing away how long after she passed did you write that song immediately it 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 was like the that shitty dark thought that like kind of creeps into your mind i'm just like oh that's terrible it would also make really great lyrics and you're just like oh, it's such a gross thought to like immediately think of that in that way so i was just like this is gross but i gotta get it off my chest and mm-hmm. i think i started writing it immediately um i wrote the chorus immediately and then kind of worked my way backwards and fleshed out the rest of the song over the course of like probably a month that's pretty cool like i mean yeah, yeah it might seem like terrible to just come up with but the thing is that's how us musicians work we get that's you let it all out you put it on paper you write a riff you that's how it works yeah and we already had the the song written and i was like this would be perfect for that one and i think the cadence and every in the chorus and everything works out really well for it mm-hmm. so i'm glad that i'm glad i got it off my chest uh i'm glad that it worked um mm-hmm. and i just hope i can't wait for people to hear it and i hope everyone enjoys it Oh, I think they're gonna enjoy this. The flow of this record, great. It brings you back to like traditional thrash, which you hardly get nowadays, you know. And yeah, like that's I was... what I loved. You guys threw it out there with because I you have to do the reading before making the questions, and you guys were this is all straightforward. No bells and whistles. We're we're straightforward, and mm-hmm. I like that. Yeah. That uh, the 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 last person I talked to, um, was talking about. I I, I guess he had a gripe with um modern like crossover thrash bands and i was like the, none of them none of them suck <laughs> like, they're all great bands but i think ha- like being kind of pushed under the thumb of um modern recording and click tracks and you know everything being like clicked together so to speak um kind of ruins it uh it just you're trying to make something super dynamic that it turns out being really flat um and I think War Remains, since we didn't really do any of that because we did it pretty quickly, um, it has its own weird uniqueness to it. It's it's pretty raw. It's kind of gritty. There's a few mistakes on it. Um, 
it's it's pretty unique and has its own little in its own little way its own little world i agree it's 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 a great record um what i have noticed though is like you guys have like a lot of like slayer sounding guitar riffs and rhythms like drum wise and that's what i was telling nikki and what was the process that inspired that were you guys listening to any certain music or is that just you guys that's just us um we like we like those old thrash bands we Mm -hmm. like how they sound like i was trying like in the studio i think i think it was zach's guitar tone or something he was playing some riff that reminded me of um skeletons of society and i was like your tone is actually kind of close to that and i listened to it like back and forth and i was like it just sounds like an old Slayer record, like <laughs> it, which is awesome. Yeah, <laughs> and I was like, "This is cool." Like, I, I like where where this is coming, or like, like where this is going, and I like where it's coming from. Um, it just it's just natural. It's just how we act, and that's how we write stuff. I mean, they're like they definitely. Uh, I'm not saying that we're not like thinking about anything, <laughs> but um, we like they put a lot of care, time, and care, and and getting the riffs perfect um and that attests to all their hard work it, i mean you can hear it it pays off oh yeah for sure you can hear it that's why like i said it, it sounds like an older record that's why earlier i said it sounds traditional it's it's, it's amazing man yeah it, i think we tr- really i think we tried to do yeah we tried to do that with kill grid and then after it came out we listened to it and we're like way off <laughs> <laughs> no like no 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 we fucked up like back to the drawing board I think we really nailed it with this one. And th- well, this is going to be your guys' third release. And you guys say What Remains is the sound you guys have been pushing for to take you guys to the next level. What was the process getting your sound there? A lot of hard work. Um, a lot of touring. Um, a lot of, yeah, a lot of sweat equity. I mean, we we manage ourselves. We do our own merch. Like, we, we do our own um, mail order. Like I'm looking at my garage right now. That's where all the merch is. And I just do it out of my garage uh, whenever we have time. Uh, it's not, it's not the most efficient, uh, but that's what we know how to do is like keeping it very DIY and our, that's just our work ethic. And that's, that's who we are as people. And I think that kind of bleeds into the, the music and our production and our, our, um, that's a good way to say it. Just our, our, our the way we live our lives, pretty much, and I, that bleeds over into into the the riffs and the, the music, I guess. That makes sense. Like that's what we need more. Like for this this industry, more D, uh, DIY type of stuff. Like everyone's just relying on these labels, and then when you guys get these bills for so much money, you're like, and it's yeah. like, dude, if you guys did it the DIY way. Like, it, uh, yeah, it's a little more time efficient, but it's less a little less money coming out of your pocket a little bit yeah the, we keep the recoupables pretty low because we don't want to we don't want to constantly be in debt it's it's mm-hmm. it's the same thing as like owning a credit card you don't want to max it out and then spend you know the next <laughs> three years trying to pay it off oh, yeah. like we don't have a bus we bought a church van for 500 bucks a couple of years ago and we're gonna run it into the fucking ground <laughs> until we get a new one that from, an, from another church <laughs> <laughs> And so it's just like, yeah, we could get Century to buy us a bus, and but then we we just have to we would owe them forever. Yeah, it's like I don't want to do that. And they, they already own your. I'm guessing because that's how it works with labels. They own your music, so why would you want to be? Because you're paying that back, so now you're gonna have to pay back for a bus. So then you're forever like there's. That's how it works. Oh, with they don't they don't own us. They don't own anything. They're just Whoa. we have a we have a licensing deal. There, the music is licensed by um century but we own it dang now, now that's a switch i was not expecting that at all yep how did that deal come about did you guys sit down you're like this is what we're gonna do and and i think that's what i think that's what they brought up because i mean when they when they um emailed us to to sign i don't think i don't know what they were expecting and i personally don't know what i was expecting um so maybe it's we're doing a lot better than they uh, expected. I'm not sure, but we got we have a licensing deal with them. Um, yeah. They don't own anything. That's but actually that's that's cool. With though. that being said, I mean that's uh, it, with that being said, it comes off kind of shitty. But I don't mean it that way at all. 
No, um, it's a good thing. That's actually a solid They're thing. fucking awesome. They're awesome to work with. Ooh. They're some of the some of the most helpful and insightful people um, and super professional. And we, like, I'm not the smartest dude in the world, but <laughs> um, they really hold my hand through a lot of stuff. Um, and Will he is usually their main port of contact, and he's like a – He's a sales rep or a business guy for uh, some painting comp- company. And uh, so he knows how to speak and like money speak. I don't know how to do that. Um, so it, we have a really good working relationship with one another, which I really, really appreciate. That's that's really good, though, because that, that makes it easier on you. But I think it's I think that's a really cool deal. I, I didn't know that you guys had a licensing. I bet a lot of bands want that. But I think that's cool. You guys have that. Yeah. Um, I was going to say it's on, I think if you check the center labels on the records or in the liner notes or something, it says that it's licensed by Century Media owned by Enforce LLC or whatever. Nice. Well, Mm -hmm. I'll have to check that out when I get my vinyl. Cool. Um, okay. So what was the process for you guys picking the track order? A lot of bickering. (laughs) Um, we, we really like usually when the, when the recording's done, I listen to it like on random and try and keep paying attention of like what came before what and see what fits. And I'll listen to it, you know, like 600 times a week to try and figure out what works best. And we all kind of work together like, okay, this has to be first. And if that's first, then by process of elimination, this has to be second. Then after that, and it just kind of keeps spiraling until you're down to the last track and you're just like, should that be the last track? maybe okay what if we swap these two and then it ends on that note and it's like it's just a lot of back and forth and you know i like it this way i like it that way and eventually it just has to come down to a vote but i think all in all that lasted like maybe a week like we didn't after a while we're just like yeah it, it flows really good the way it does and by the time it's over kind of inclined to start playing it again from the beginning so i've noticed that a lot with with uh, with people that who I've been doing interviews with, they're just like, dude, once it's over, I like, I immediately start playing it again. I'm just like, yeah, it's a weird phenomenon. Like, <laughs> I'd say like 95 people I've talked to are just like, yeah, I, I listened to it like seven times today. You're like, good God. <laughs> That's a lot. That's it, a lot of time. great, dude. Well, t- yeah. like I said earlier, it takes you back to like listening to like Overkill or fucking Megadeth, like early, early Megadeth or like early Slayer. It takes you back to like the traditional thrash which we haven't had in how long like a lot of bands can't give you that anymore and that's what mm-hmm. i've noticed and that's the, believe me like i would love for more bands to sound like overkill like fill the fire taking over status like i miss mm-hmm. i miss bands that sound like that yeah so well, like I get that it's incredible thank you um so with you being a vocalist writing lyrics how do you go about naming the songs like you said you do all this research do you just just like oh grab one uh one word from your lyrics or how do you go about it well kind of going back to the uh the research paper analogy like Mm -hmm. think of the titles as like chapter names and less like less like the title of a song it's more just like here's the thesis here's how i can sum up this song and as in the smallest amount of words possible like that and that's just going to be the title of the chapter and then i'll explain the chapter and then we'll go to the next chapter kind of thing that's You're the like, easiest oh. way i can explain it i don't sense. start i don't start with the title it's just kind of once i'm done with it i'm like that sounds good yeah this song's about ultra violence they'll mm-hmm. get it <laughs> i'm just kidding yeah <laughs> <laughs> um do you do any vocal warm-ups before like playing a show or before recording no nope what uh, your vocals are pretty like rangy too well, thank you. I don't know where it comes from. Like, I don't prep. I, I, I do breathing exercises to get my, like, lungs up because, you know, this ain't helping. But yeah. so I just kind of, you know, just inhale as much as possible, hold my breath, let it out super slow, do that, like, maybe 10 times and ready to rock. And then you run on stage and you're like, you got your Bobby Blitz vocals going. I'm just kidding. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah pretty much. That's yeah. I don't I don't think. I know Alex drum warms up his hands. Um, I think everyone just kind of 
struts around with their instruments and just kind of picks around and stuff just to kind of get their hands going. But other than that, it's not like a long prep of getting ready to go on stage. It's kind of just kind of like, oh, we're about to go. Okay. Like, and then just get up there and <laughs> fucking whoop ass. That's what it takes, man. And that makes sense. It's better to take less time than like hours. And that, well, some people do it, but whatever. Yeah. I mean, if whatever helps, I mean, everyone's completely different. Oh, yeah. Like I know what works for me. And I think having smoking makes my voice sound like shit <laughs> and drinking kind of makes it sound kind of wet. So <laughs> it has this kind of fucked up like bark to it that um, I like. <laughs> It hey, makes it, it sound good. it makes it sound insanely vicious. It sounds like I sound like a madman. <laughs> so madman. Yeah. Everyone in the group calls me the insane bastard. And I still don't know why, but maybe that's what I sound like. Hey, if that's what it takes, right? Do you yeah. guys have any tour rituals? Rituals on tour? Yeah. Not really. Like what do you mean? Like what's an what would be an example of a ritual? Okay, so last week when I interviewed Old Sulphur, the guitar player told me that they like to go to Bucky's and some other oh, guy. Stuff like that. Yeah, or like, you know, before you go on stage, you guys put your hands in and go, woo, I don't know what you guys do. Like, no, something. we don't do that. Uh, <laughs> we, we, what's something that we do always do on tour? I don't know. We always, we're always trying to make each other laugh. So, Every tour has its own little like inside joke that slowly comes into like our, you know, day to day speech. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> we'll get out of the van and everyone's starting to talk real funny. And all the other bands are like, what the hell are y'all talking about? It's just like, you weren't there. Like, you missed it. And now, and then everyone has like FOMO because they have no idea what we're talking about. Um, I know damn near is a phrase that has entered the, lex the lexicon of just, we'll say damn near about anything. <laughs> it was, it was, yeah, it was damn near cold last night. Yeah, damn near. Uh, that, see, it's not funny. Like, <laughs> it's, but it's just, we just constantly keep doing it and changing it and evolving it. Um, and it comes out of boredom. That comes out of people talking about their weird dreams. Um, what situations like it doesn't matter we're always trying to to bust balls and and crack wise with one another hey that makes sense that's a that's a good ritual to have though like it's all about pumping your as a self self to you know yeah we're just we're just trying to have a good time like no one wants to be stuck in a van for five weeks oh yeah uh, uh, and be a be in a bad mood like that's a that's that's really that's a terrible place to be in so, <clears throat> especially when you're like that, like three thousand miles away from home, it's not fun. Um, so we always try to keep uh, spirits pretty high, not just us, but for the rest of the tour package as well. Just try to fuck around with people and have some fun. That makes sense. Uh, do you guys have any th crazy things on your tour riders? No, um, we have like a veggie tray. We're suckers for like a charcuterie board, so. Nice. Just like that, like meat and crackers and cheese, veggie tray, couple cases of beer, and um, I think it's like either a either a bottle of Jameson or a bottle of tequila. I mean, we rarely get that, so it's just mm -hmm. so I'm happy to have anything. Um, Makes sense. Uh, that but... We didn't have to pay for. Um, Makes sense. Some, yeah, some some um, some venues are nice enough to give you a like a, a buyout. They'll give you like 20 bucks. Oh, shit. Yeah. To just go get your own food, go get your own beer. It's, I think at the end of the day, it's cheaper for them. Makes uh, sense. Instead of, yeah. Instead of running around trying to do, do a, instead of trying to do like a big grocery list for every single band, they're just like, here's 20 bucks, get your own shit. And do you guys okay. have any, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, do you guys have any crazy eating habits on the road? Crazy eating habits. We always try <laughs> to, go to grocery stores and like make stuff for sandwiches and whatnot 
and we have this cooler that sits between the driver's seat and then the sh and shotgun and the ice always melts and it always gets into all the sandwich stuff so by the after like a week of that it's just like okay the water in here is ham water there's pieces of pepperoni like floating around there's a hot wet bottle of mustard that is now full of water <laughs> um and the Italian dressing is leaking. And you're just like, why do we keep doing this? <laughs> why? And we eventually have to throw everything out and then go just go get food from a gas station. So um, I have gotten into the routine of eating cup noodles. Like go, when you go to a gas station, instead of, you know, trying to buy every single snack in the world, just get a cup noodle and like a Red Bull and just keep it low. Because by the time you get to the next gas station, you're probably going to be a little hungry then anyway. So just get another cup noodle. That'll just tie you over and it's like a dollar. Yeah. So. That makes sense. It, it's Especially like touring in the winter and stuff. Like just trying to get something hot from a gas station is hard. But they always have like hot water and cup noodles. So put them together. Easy. That's. Mm -hmm. And then you can stack them all. You when you empty, we can stack them all up and just put them in someone's pillowcase. It's great. <laughs> put them in someone's pillowcase. Is that is that no? Is, see, that's a tour ritual right there. <laughs> uh, well, I just thought of that, and uh, now it's gonna be. Oh, poor guys. Sorry. Hopefully they're gonna. They're a. <laughs> hey, they might enjoy it. They we might like the space. Yeah, we ran out of space. Um, <laughs> we do have a trash. We use this uh, Lowe's five gallon bucket. Uh, and then we added a like a suction cup to the handle, so mm -hmm. the trash can is stuck to the window, uh, and that eventually gets really gross. Um, and then it eventually falls and then spills everywhere. That so, sounds terrible. It's a great system. <laughs> it sounds like a great system. I it's, actually was hoping it works. <laughs> I was hoping with the ice cooler, with you saying everything gets in, they got pepperoni floating in there, ham water. I was thinking you guys are gonna pour it in a cup. And just drink it. That was going to be a toy ritual. That's what I was I thinking. <laughs> I have yet to clean out the cooler from the last tour. And how it's long ago was that? Uh, we got home in mid-December. And I am terrified to open that thing up. <laughs> but I got to do it. <sighs> it's going to be fun. You're going to have a great time. I promise I you. Know, I, just, I just know that there's still beers in there. Hey, you can have a hammy beer. No, you... <laughs> no. No, no. <laughs> oh the thought of that makes me queasy so you guys toured with so, like a lot of thrash legends do you have a dream lineup for a tour for you guys uh dream lineup yeah uh flair um cavalera would be Ooh. cool and demolition hammer Gosh, yeah and us yeah four that's good four enough yeah, well, um, you, you don't want to cut two into our drinking time to because we we like to pregame before we go inside the venue. Yeah, I mean, and just four is the perfect amount. Like five starts to you know, your knees and feet start to hurt. Um, but four, like four, like I, I, we'd play it for like forty five minutes. That'd be cool, and then everyone else plays for like forty five minutes to an hour, which would be cool because like. Imagine Slayer trying to boil down their set to an hour. That'd be hard. That'd be hard and cool. Like, just like, that would be the most, like, it would just be nothing. I mean, it all, last time I saw him, it was like two and a half hours and it was already nothing but bangers. Yeah. But like, an hour, that would be like, you would have to be, you'd be glued to it the entire time. Like, because man. you're just like, it's only an hour. Like, I got to soak up as much as possible. And every record till, I don't know, for me, it's about, um, uh... Until seasons are all bangers. Everything after that's a little. Oh, dude, God hates us all is sick. That song "Payback" is awesome. <laughs> um, I need to listen. I need to re-listen to Diabolus. Diabolicus is that it? The Musica, and then there. What was their last one? Repentless. I need to listen to that one again. I remember liking it, so I need to brush up on it. Makes sense. And then, um. So you guys have already done a bunch of tours. Have you taken or learned anything from those bands that you have as tour musts nowadays? Tour musts. Like. Yeah, like you learned something like last week the guy was telling me the 
they're mostly down to just having drums and computers. Like they they plug straight into the. Oh. Um. No, nothing like that. I mean. Well, we... Of course, that'd be kind of weird for thrash. Well, it's not even that. I mean, like some things are. Some things are kind of. What's the word? I guess pre-programmed. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not naming names because I'm not gonna. I don't want to hear it. Um, <laughs> but some some effects and some things are pre-programmed to to hit at certain times. Of course. Um, so everything's timed to like to the fucking T. Um, so it's just like a, a crazy amount of professionalism goes into that just mm-hmm. to make it hit that much harder for the audience. So it's not necessarily a bad thing that some people do that. Uh, it would just be weird if I did it. I don't think I would ever do that. But I think camaraderie is like a big thing that we learned on tour. Like, and like I harkened back earlier, like everyone here is trying to have a good time and make this a positive experience. And so no one wants a bad attitude. Um, we're all kind of, we're in it together. It's not necessarily like, you know, four or five bands on tour. It's not like four or five different little camps. It's one camp of all of us. Like, and it has to be that way in order for it to be the best tour ever. Mm -hmm. Like we've been really lucky with the tour, with the bands we've been on uh, on tour with. And just every single one is better than the last one. Then like, which is, we're we're just incredibly lucky with the the type of people that we've been on tour with and the bands we've been on tour with. They're they're I hope they're lifelong friends now. Like they're, for me, I love them all to death. So, I feel like that's how it usually becomes after if it's a good tour. You guys become like, cause like I know so many bands. You still hang out with those guys that they started off with. Yeah, and that's how it usually should be. Like, like that's just how it is in the metal world. Yeah, like us and High Command is a really good example. We play with High Command back in on my birthday, August twenty seventh, two thousand seventeen, uh, in Richmond. We got along so fucking good. We went to wherever they were staying that night, partied until like six in the morning, or they did. I definitely didn't because I can't do that. And um, we've been like super t- close friends ever since. We did a, a, a two week tour together. Um, I think they're going to play our record release show. They're coming down from Worcester. We played with them in Germany randomly. We just cut cross paths mm-hmm. and for three days. And yeah, they always stay at somebody at one of our houses and stuff. And like, uh, yeah, the, they're my like extended family at this point. Hell yeah. Th- them and Gate Creeper, I would I would consider extended family. Hell yeah, that's cool. That's actually really cool. How do you guys prepare for a tour? <sighs> Say goodbye <laughs> uh, to all of our loved ones and our dogs, and um, t- pack pack light. That's about it. Um, where my house is, I've kind of got like this weird side yard behind the garage and everyone parks their cars in the side yard. Mm-hmm. And then we, everyone meets here. Uh, Will comes with the trailer and the van. We load up the van then go to our practice spot, load up the trailer and it's on the, on the road. Like it's pretty just cut and dry. Like let's get the fuck out of here. Yeah. You got like you guys seem very straightforward. <laughs> like, let's go. Yeah, there's no, there's no point to just kind of dilly dally. I remember one tour. I can't remember which one it is, but we tried to leave at two on a Friday, and everyone kept forgetting something, so we had to keep constantly going over to other people's houses. And by the time that we left, it was five o'clock on a Friday, and we got stuck in traffic for two and a half hours. So he didn't even get out of Richmond until like seven o'clock, and we left at two. Damn. It was so annoying. Hey. Yeah, but that's Did just you... how it goes. By the end of it, by the time we finally got out of it, out of traffic, we're all just super pissed. And then it was just then. Now that we're over it, it was funny. It was just like that was the dumbest shit. Hey, but yeah, it happens. It's, it's, yeah, it's it hard. happens. It's fine. Do you guys make a list nowadays where you're like, okay, can't forget this, can't forget this? Nope. Nope. <laughs> We're going to make the same mistake over and over and over again. And every time we do, it's going to be funnier than the last time. 
Hey, it makes sense. Uh, you guys toured with a bunch of really great bands. Has there been a one that's been your favorite? Favorite favorite band to tour with, or just one of like the biggies? Well, like one that you guys toured with that. Because I know that I was reading that you've hit all your like your your wish not wish list, but your your goal list is getting smaller and smaller. My bucket list is getting small. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Um. They all have their different charms. I mean, touring with Sacred Reich was really cool. Phil Ryan is a fucking awesome human being. Learned a lot from him because he has such like a, he's like the Buddha of metal. He's like so calm. And like when he enters a room, everyone's just like, like so relaxed. He's sick. Um, Touring with Obituary was cool. We got to stay, like practically recreate the uh turn inside out like headbangers ball video uh at uh a venue where like the entire tour package was just stage diving the entire their entire set and they fucking loved it they're like that was the best fucking show we played in years thanks to you (laughs) (laughs) and i was like that's awesome like i'm glad everyone's on the same page like we're just all trying to have a good time um yeah i mean there's there's a lot i mean I, i would say just I would say obituary. I mean, that seems kind of like a cop out, but I don't think so. Like, twelve year old me would never believe me. Like, <laughs> would never believe that to ever be a possibility. It would take multiple lifetimes to achieve that, and I did it in one. So that's sick. That makes sense. I mean, come on, mm-hmm. you have Terry Butler. Yeah, another badass. another gentle badass. Like. He's so sick and very calming oh, yeah. and very down to earth. I love Terry. They're all they're all cool in their own different ways. Yeah, they are they're definitely. I, that's a great choice. Um, with you guys about to drop your third record, what songs do you feel are songs that you have to play at each show? Uh, War Remains, Hang Grab My Hand. We've already started doing that the last tour. We incorporated two new songs. Um, Aggressive Menace. War Remains, Hanged, Empire. I don't know. I would like to just play the whole the whole album every night, to be completely honest. But that'd be cool. There's some, there's some, there's some. Excuse me. There's some uh, crowd pleasers that we have to play. Um, that I enjoy playing, but it's also like some of them are getting up there in age, like six years in age. <laughs> so I'm like kind of getting tired of playing them, but people are having a good time and I'm not one to disappoint, you know, a crowd of, you know, 20 or 20,000. I don't, I'll, I'll play what you want me to play. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, would you say, since you're saying there is one, you have to play every show, which songs would you say are your staple songs that you have to play each show? Reckoning force, the heat, malignance. Um, I think that's it. We have to play those. And then what well, our our what we try to do is you know, let's just say hypothetically we have to play for 30 minutes. So we try and cram as many songs as we can into 30 minutes. And so we try to play the shortest, fastest songs. Because we usually play them a little bit faster live anyway. So in 30 minutes we can probably get like nine to eleven songs done um because we only take one break right in the middle but if like we're we're we have a 30 minute set down for the next tour and sometimes we're hitting like festivals and we have to play for 45 Mm -hmm. so we just tacked on 15 minutes onto the top of it so now so for the for the um 45 minute set we played nine songs straight no breaks fast as shit take a 30 second break and then play five more songs dang that sounds intense dude not gonna it's, lie it's fucking hard it's a gauntlet it sounds pretty hard because oh 30 second break is just like breathing for a second you're like okay it's, back. it's literally just a retune so they retune pretty quickly so i'm and i have nothing to say so i'm just like hell yeah <laughs> this is fucking sick you guys having fun awesome <laughs> Damn! Like, Dude. back to it. Like, hey, that's yeah. how it works. That's how. That's nope, good though. No breaks. Yeah, no more breaks. That's good. So let's talk about. We're gonna get into talking about the music videos. 
You guys have two music videos and one visualizer. Who directed the two music videos? Um, we directed the Hang music video. Mm-hmm. That's footage that we have from like a VHS camera that we bring on tour. So it's live footage from the Slave to the Grave and at the Gates tours. And along with we shot some, we realized that like more is better. So trying to cut down, you know, 45 minutes of uh, film into how long is that song? Three and a half minutes. Isn't 45 minutes isn't enough. Yeah. So we, uh, we played a local show here and just advertise it as a, uh, you know, video music, video recording Mm -hmm. thing. And we had people all over the place with random camcorders and stuff um, and just kind of spliced all that and mixed all of that together. Uh, Ethan, our bassist, did all of that. So yeah. he's the he's the fucking goat when it comes to that stuff. Uh, and then Devin Davies, um, I think he's a, he's a mutual friend or an acquaintance. I don't know exactly. I don't remember exactly how we met him. But I think he came to a show in New York and we were chit-chatting. And then when it came down to picking a director or something for, for Starve, we were just like, well, he, he does it. Let's hit him up. Um, and so he came down, shot the live footage for Starve that you see in all the TVs. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, then he went back to New York and shot the rest in an, uh, an abandoned church basement. Dang. Yeah. So we just kind of, and we didn't really tell him what to do. We we're just like, you, you do whatever you feel like it and yeah we we barely told him like after we got the first cut we're just like just change like things here and there take that out maybe add some footage from this instead um and that was basically it so we have we have one more that's coming out on the day the record comes out and that's by far the fucking coolest well i'm excited to see it it's gonna yeah. uh but um I thought it was cool with uh, Star of How you guys did that because, like, I, when I was watching it, I was like, "Dude, did they do this at like eight different shows, or did like what was it was because it was pretty intense. Like, there's just so much going on, but like in a cool way." Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was um just two locations. I mean, we did we did all the live shots in like a couple hours, mm-hmm. and uh, I hung out with Devin for the rest of the day, and then took him to the train station the next day. I mean, nice. No, we're like you said, <laughs> pretty straightforward. Like I know, <laughs> there's, there's no like we're pretty uh, utilitarian, hardworking people. So there's kind of like there's just kind of no bullshitting when it comes down to getting work done. Hey, that's how it works, though, dude. I yeah. I was actually surprised for the uh, ultra violence you guys did a uh, visualize. Like, why do you why do you guys do that instead of anything else? Uh, Century really wanted us to do one. We didn't do one for Kill Grid, okay. um, for any of those singles, because we thought like, I don't know, it's kind of cheesy. But I really liked the lyrics on uh, Ultra Violence, so I was like, maybe we should do it for that one. So there, sh- it's short and sweet, not a lot of lyrics involved into it. So you could probably read it and learn the lyrics pretty quickly <laughs> yeah so that was that was just yeah and the, the the first pass they did all the lyrics were in comic sans and we were like no <laughs> like, this isn't a cartoon i mean um so they changed the font and fine whatever and i guess i have to ask this question um who designed the album cover joe patagno uh he did uh kill Grid. He's most notably famous for doing the Motorhead logo, mm-hmm. uh, along with uh, a, a huge, a prolific portfolio of of album covers and stuff. I think he designed. I don't know if he painted it or not, but he designed. You know the Led Zeppelin like Fallen Angel mm-hmm. logo you see all the time. I think he had he had his hand in that as well. Yes. That now that's cool, dude. He's a he's a legend. He's a fucking oh, yeah. legend. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, yeah, he, he emailed me out of the blue, um, right before the decibel tour, and was just like, 
what are you thinking, man? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't even have lyrics. Like, the songs aren't even done. He's like, well, just give me your notes and we'll work from there. I was like, well, okay. So I just consistently was just would just write down psychotic things <laughs> and uh, send it to him. He was just like, this is perfect. This is perfect. I want more. More. So I was just just fed him. I fed him everything I could possibly come up with. And um, I think towards the end of that tour, I think it was like mid-February, uh, he emailed me with the sketch of it. And I was just like, that's insane. <laughs> <laughs> Considering that he basically took my brain and wrote it and drew it. And I was like, well, that's very disturbing. And I should probably <laughs> talk to somebody. But uh, good job. Really good job. I, I fucking love the album cover. Oh, it's great. It's it's, it's pretty cool. I I, I I like it a lot. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Um, I, I I owe him I owe him a, a huge debt of gratitude. Like he's he's a great guy to work with. Oh, it came out cool. I I you guys did a great. Well, he did a great job picking your brain and throwing it all out there. Now we know yeah. what you're thinking the whole time. <laughs> Yeah, now you can see what it looks like inside my head, and it's terrible. <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty intense. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Disturbing. Yeah. So, what can we expect from Enforced in 2023? Um, we will have a beer that's being released <laughs> the 27th through the Vale Brewery. Uh, I believe you can order it online. Um, it comes out April 27th. No, it comes out April 28th, but. We're having like a listening party taste test thing on the 27th. So it comes out with the, with the, um, with the album. Nice. Um, we all got our, the band's copies of um, the LPs a couple days ago. So those are going to start being shipped out when the record comes out. Um, we're going to be on tour with Venom. And then there's a couple more dates that haven't been announced. We'll be on another full U.S. tour. Um, that hasn't been announced yet and then hopefully some other things going on in the fall but none oh, of that's yeah. been announced yet so we, we got a, we got a pack a pack a pack year well that makes sense i mean with the album that yeah it's the way you have to do it so yeah i ho- hopefully i'd like to go back to europe or maybe australia or something yeah in support of this record i wouldn't want to skip it you know those are awesome yeah. places to play and i would like to go I'd like to spend more time in the UK. I think, I think the last time we spent like five days, I was like, you could, we could definitely spend two weeks here, no problem. Definitely, that's definitely one place you can't just spend two or three days, five days, and then you have nah. to do the nah. whole the whole thing. And yeah, then no one, no one travels all that far, so it's just like we, don't. we have to hit every single little city. Yeah, that's perfect though. So then you get to see everything. Yeah, I know it'd be great. <laughs> so where can everyone keep up with Enforce and buy the new record? Uh, you can buy the new record if you go to our um, Instagram page, Enforced RVA. Uh, we have a link tree that has all the links to tickets, uh, to albums, to merch, um, where you can buy all the different copies, uh, different colorways and stuff like that. All the information's there. Um, I don't think we rarely check the Facebook anymore, but so don't go there. <laughs> just, just go to go to the Instagram or go to our band camp, which is, I believe is just enforced band camp, enforced.bandcamp.com. Yeah. Um, I don't think anyone goes to Facebook anymore, but I don't. Um, <laughs> it's, it, yeah, it's weird, but, um, but yeah, that's the easiest way to get to us is through Instagram. Definitely. And uh, I'd like to thank you for being on the show. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Thank you for your time. Um, Well, we're going to end the show. See you guys next interview.